and they come for that last time. Well, we've been talking about getting a divorce, but we thought we'd come to you before we do. Maybe you can perform a miracle on us. And one or both of them will talk about the fact that, well, we've just fallen out of love. Do you realize how untrue that statement is? You don't, and I know we say it, right? Oh, I fell in love with her. Right? And some of you who saw my Facebook pasting this week, posting, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> some of you who saw that saw a picture of just a beautiful young lady. Beautiful. And it was on our wedding day. And it's a picture of Debbie on our wedding day. 41 years ago last Monday. Yeah. yeah, you applaud, but uh, sh she's the one who needs the applause. <laughs> um, and frankly, I didn't really fall in love with Debbie. I started to enjoy her. I started to laugh with her. I became her friend. I thought she was attractive. <laughs> I mean, that was somewhat important for me to at least have some appeal. She had to be somewhat appealing to me. Um, but, but I got to know Debbie as a friend. <laughs> it probably didn't hurt that she felt sorry for the student body president who didn't have a date to the homecoming dinner. And so she went just so he would have a date. And so those freshman girls wouldn't keep bothering him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you've heard the story. <laughs> but the tough thing is, is that you'll have somebody sit down in your office like that and they will say, we've fallen out of love. Love is a decision that we make. Our emotions might be influenced and affected by it, but it's a conscious choice that we make. Much like God, who the Bible says, He loved us so much that what did He do? He chose to send His Son to come and to die for us. So while today I... I want you to focus, especially couples, on your relationship. And even if your spouse is not here, you can still focus on it, right? You can still think about your commitment to them. Yeah. <laughs> A bunch of elbows going right now, some <laughs> friends. <laughs> but it's really for everybody. <clears throat> This is a message, and notice the context of 1 Corinthians 13, which is the main text that I'm using this morning, the context actually has nothing to do with marriage. That's interesting. The context of 1 Corinthians 13 is to a really messed up church. They're gossiping, they're, they're offending one another, they're being rude and inconsiderate, they're even going to communion and quick eating up the food before some other people can eat it because they haven't eaten, and they're just being downright selfish people. To top it off, the kind of weird things that they're doing, they're, they're saying that sin is okay, it doesn't really matter. They even have a brother in their, in their church who is sleeping with his father's wife. Okay, I mean, it's a mess, okay? But they're like, like, well, but hey, but we are gracious, <laughs> okay? We accept this brother just the way he is. <laughs> yeah, the sad thing is that they don't realize that God sent his son to die for sin, to pay the price of sin. And you've got to admit sin so that you can receive the gift that he wants to give you. So this is a messed up church. And to really top it off, it's a spirit-filled, anointed church with all kinds of supernatural giftings. But some of them are saying, hey, the ones who speak in tongues, they're the really super ones. The ones who get words from God and can stand up and say, God told me. <laughs> They're the, they're, the, they're the ones that are really anointed. And they're starting now even compete over the supernatural giftings that God has given to every single believer. 
So they're a messed up group. Because of that, in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about spiritual gifts. He says, okay, I've got to explain some things here. Let's talk about tongues. Let's talk about gifts of knowledge. Let's talk about the gifts of healings and miracles and all these different things. Let's talk about this because these are gifts given to the body of Christ to build up the body of Christ, not to make you all think you are wonderful or some super saint. And in fact, take note, the gifts come from God. They're not in credit for your good. They're about what God wants to do in this world through his people, not because you're so wonderful. And then he pauses. Just after this pause, he's going to come back in chapter 14, and he's going to again talk about the spiritual gifts. He's going to again talk about tongues. He's going to remind them that it's all about us building up one another and helping one another come closer to Christ as we use these God-given gifts that are all about him. Now he pauses right in the, in the middle of that sandwich. He puts, gives them the meat. He says, let me show you the most excellent way. You think it's all about all these gifts and all these things that you can do, but let me show you the most excellent way. And he is then going to give us a description, some call it a definition of love. So if you have your Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians 13. And you know, folks, you are welcome today to soak in 1 Corinthians 13 and shut me off. Okay? <laughs> You are welcome just to let 1 Corinthians 13 uh, speak to you for the next 20 or 30 minutes until we're ready to do the vows. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... Oh, he took his sticks with him. Shucks. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can even move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body even to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Did you see the, <laughs> the cell phones? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't keeping a record. He was just throwing them away in one box. <laughs> Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. God, I pray that you will help us to understand this word. I pray, the Lord, that it would speak to every single person here today. Obviously, Lord, I, I believe that you want to inspire and encourage and challenge and renew the marriages represented in this room. And I thank you for that, God. 
I thank you, Lord, that the joy that we experienced on our wedding days is not the joy that you want to just stop there, but you want it to continue. The romance that, that has happened because we intentionally did things to drop our little heart or to pass our note or to communicate our love to that special person. That we need to keep doing that, God, and help us to do that. So, Lord, I, I'm praying that you would inspire and encourage and challenge every one of the marriages represented in this room. I pray your protection upon every one of them, God. For there are all kinds of attacks that come and try to undermine the, the relationship of love. Some of those attacks come from the outside, others who don't even want us to remain married. But some of those t attacks come from within us, our temptation, our own human thinking, our own weaknesses. So I pray your protection on the marriages. But Lord, I don't just pray for the marriages represented here today. Father, every single person here is a child that you love. A special one in your creation. And I pray that every person here would hear again the importance of your love and, and this definition of love that, that really speaks about you. For you are love. And as we look at you, your love. Oh my. Oh my. When we take it seriously, we can't resist. And I thank you for that, God. I pray that we wouldn't resist you today. This is one of those days, God, that I want every person here to experience your love in a fresh new way, to be reminded of that love. And I pray that every one of us would recommit ourselves to you and to the love you give us. Now, God, you keep opening up this word to us in Christ's name. Amen. If I don't have love, <laughs> then I'm just noisy. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. And if I don't have love, it doesn't matter what I do. I can be wonderful for all kinds of people. But if I don't have love, I gain nothing at all. Now, now as you read those first few verses, it almost sounds like, wow, hey, you know, maybe I could get ahead if I give something to somebody else, right? And, and there is some, some sense of community value and respect if you give to other people. But, but, but God's really trying to say, there's nothing gained without real love. It's important for us to understand something this morning that as we go through this message on love, that love and respect go hand in hand. Too often, we have preached sermons on marriage and we have said to the men, love your wife like Christ loved the church. Does the Bible say that? Yes, it does, gentlemen. Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice. So a husband should love his wife that same way, making sacrifice. And, and most men that I know want to do that. There is that sense of knight in shining armor, isn't there, guys? <laughs> You kind of want to be that special guy for her. You want to protect her. You want to rush in when everyone else is rushing out. You want to be there for her. Or at least you did. <laughs> <laughs> Men, love your wife like Christ loved the church. Be willing to sacrifice yourself. But here's our challenge is for too long when we've said that, the whole focus has been there. Love, love, love. And 1 Corinthians clearly is about love, yes? Yeah. Ah. But if you're looking also at Ephesians 5, you'll see that there's another equal command to the one for husbands to love their wives. Do you know what it is? Well, if you were to look at Ephesians 5, in verse 21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
If you hear that and listen carefully to that verse, this is the, the kind of the, the verse that prepares the way for the rest of the chapter. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Men and women, husbands and wives, what is it saying for you? In the year of a partnership with your spouse, and each of you are to submit to the other. Each of you are supposed to hold that other in high regard. Each of you are supposed to respect one another. But then God knows that we both have needs and weaknesses. And he knows that ladies need to be told, I love you. It's good if you learn their love language because if you think that giving them things communicates love and their love language is service, your things that you give them aren't going to go very far in communicating the love that you wanted to express. So it's really helpful to learn their love language, guys. But take note, ladies, ladies, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Later in Ephesians 5, it actually explains that submission means to respect. Respect. To hold them in high regard. There's a reason why there's this joke that behind every good man is what? A good woman. Why is that the case? Why is that so fundamental, so spread out all across the land? Because there's truth to it. It's the, a design that God created that there would be respect from the woman to the man and love from the man to the woman. That the man would learn how to serve her like Christ served the church. Notice that's not being Lord over her, is it? But girls, do you realize the danger the attack of darkness that wants you to not respect your husband. And he even said it in a similar language that he used for the men. Men, you're supposed to love like Christ loved the church, right? And well, ladies, you are supposed to respect your husband in the same way that you show respect for Jesus. Now that ought to clarify some things right there for you, shouldn't it? Our respect for Jesus is not, yes, Jesus, whatever you say, you mean tyrant, you make me do all kinds of things that I don't want to do, but okay, you're going to abuse me and beat me up and treat me meanly, but I'm going to submit. Is that what it means? <laughs> no, no. To respect your husband is about your responsibility. It's about a reverence. It's about honoring them. In the way that you honor Christ. You see, the command is for both of us, isn't it? And he starts it out by submit to one another out of that reverence that you both have for Christ. Guys, do you mind if your wife says, I love you? Not much response there. <laughs> I'm guessing maybe you do then. <laughs> So Guys, do you mind if your wife says, I love you? No. no. Girls, do you mind if your husband respects you? Yeah. Okay, it's really quiet again. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if your husband holds you in high regard, ladies? No. No, no you don't. The point is not, okay, women respect, men love, and neither one has to do the other. Uh-uh. <laughs> Okay, we both are supposed to do both. But at the core of this is, is that men need the respect, women need the love. Okay? And we both have to learn how to do it better for the other. Amen. Respect <coughs> and love. <coughs> love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. It, well, let's actually go through them. Incidentally, just uh, because uh, I, I, Paul and I had some, some discussion about this this week. Have you ever heard it said, I love you, but you need to earn my respect? 
Really? Let's switch that. I respect you, but you need to earn my love. No. <laughs> See, what lady would appreciate that? I respect you, dear, but you need to earn my love. <laughs> and the sad thing is, ladies, some of you are saying, oh, I love you, honey, but you need to earn my respect. Really? That is not what the Word says. I have a responsibility for the respect. I have a responsibility for the love. And God will help us both do them. Do you know what the opposite of love and respect is? <coughs> the opposite of love is the person who sits down in my office and they said, okay, it's over. Really? Well, let's talk about, what was it like when you were married? I don't really want to talk about it because I don't really don't care. The opposite of love is I don't care. It's complacency. You don't like what I just said to you? I don't care. You don't like it that I have a boyfriend or girlfriend on the side? I don't care. You don't like my attitude? I don't care. Okay. That's the opposite of love. What's the opposite of respect? <clears throat> Contempt? If respect is admiration, appreciation, even affection and approval, then the opposite of that is this contempt. It's an actual rejection. It's very similar, isn't it, to I don't care. When you hold someone in high regard, when you love them, you respect him or her. So what, is, what does Paul say? He says love is patient. <laughs> the, the literal translation of that is love has a long mind. A long mind. You keep thinking before you're reacting. <laughs> you're counting to 10 or 100 or 1,000 if you have to, okay? You have a long mind. Chrys Chrysostom said that it is a word used of the man who is wronged and who has it easily in his power to avenge himself, yet will not do it. He could beat her up or him up, but he won't. Love is patient. Love is kind. To be kind, you think about that word, tender, compassionate, obliging to others. Oh, you want to have the space where I'm driving? Please. <laughs> love is love is kind <laughs> love does not envy it's not grieved by what someone else has oh, they, look at that beautiful house they have that wonderful car they have that, look at everything's great for them you don't know the cancer they have also but nevertheless look how great it is and you get all upset you're not grieved you're not hurting in fact instead of that you rejoice at the blessings that somebody else is experiencing uh, uh, aren't you that way with kids if you have them hopefully you rejoice when something good happens for them you celebrate that love is, does not envy. Love does not boast. It, it doesn't want to be noticed or, or applauded, it, but rather it wants God to be honored. See, the, the real lover cannot ever get over the wonder that he is loved. When you understand that God loves you, you can't get past that. Love, love is kept humble by the consciousness that it can never offer its loved one a gift which is good enough. Some of us have tried. <laughs> Some of us tried to do something really special for our spouse, right? But love says, you know, nothing I do. I was at the store this morning waiting for the, the cake, the new hearts to be added to the cake over there. You have to take a look at that. And the guy comes up to me and says, whatever you did wrong, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> I'm more experienced than you, man, and I've had to apologize for what, and that's not going to do it. I don't care how hard you try. 
<laughs> See, love says, there's, there's nothing I can do, nothing I can do to, to earn that love. Whoa. Or to earn that respect from my spouse or from God. Love's not proud. <laughs> It's not inflated with a sense of your own importance. You know, well, I'm special, that's why you love me. <laughs> you know, it, we are, what's the word? The word for love is charis. Charis. If you think about that, it's the word that go, leads for charismatic. It's the word that leads into charity. It's the word of grace. It's not earned. We are grace gifted and all that we have comes from God. He goes on and says, love does not dishonor others. It's not rude. It's not brutish. It's not an egomaniac. It's, it's not somebody saying, look at me, how wonderful I am. And just, no, love is not that way. <clears throat> love isn't the spouse who has to put down their mate in public to somehow make themselves feel better. If you're talking about your spouse, and maybe the worst one of it is you're talking about your spouse and he or she's standing right there and you're putting them down, that is not love and it is not respect. Barclay said, love does not behave gracelessly. It is significant fact that the Greek, the words for grace are for the charm are the same. There's a kind of Christianity which takes a delight in being blunt and almost brutal. Have you noticed that? There's strength in it, but there's no winsomeness. Barclay goes on, he says, Lightfoot of Durham said of Arthur F. Sim, one of his students, let him go where he will. His face will be a sermon in itself. There is a graciousness in Christian love which never forgets that courtesy and tact <laughs> and politeness are lovely things. Not to be political, but there wasn't a lot of love on the stage last night. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> love is not easily angered. Love doesn't rage. Love doesn't explode. It's not easily provoked or irritated. So our guys were praying yesterday morning in our men's group and we were praying about our relationships and how we show love to our spouses. And I remember warning us, Doug, <laughs> I remember warning us that when you go back home, something might happen that to tempt you to not be so loving and good listener and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, Doug, but I got real tempted to get irritated yesterday. <laughs> And that's not about Debbie. That's about inside of Bill, okay? And, but love, love is not easily angered. Did I say love's a decision? You see, in those moments when emotion wants to erupt and emotion wants to take over, I have to consciously choose to love and not be irritable, resentful, mean-spirited, holler out. Scream, react, whatever. And the fact is, is that, guys and gals, some of us forget to make the choice. And we give in to the emotions, and we get angry, or we rage, or we abuse. And love and respect are decisions. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, you don't have a scorebook. And I've had see, seen some spouses that did that. They came in with their list. Oh, yeah, we're in trouble, kids. <laughs> so I had them go home and write their own list. A new one. You need to go home and watch for good things that you see him do. He does nothing good. <laughs> then you're going to have to work harder at seeing it. <laughs> And you keep track of the positive things. And when you see something, you go up and you say, thank you. 
And before you leave in the morning or when you come back together at the evening, say, hi, have a great day. I love you. Hello, it's good to see you again. I love you. Oh, and by the way, do it with a, with a touch. <laughs> a touch. Not one that's trying to say, hey, girl, I want more. <laughs> a touch that says, I care about you. Gentle connection to that person. We need to keep track of the good things. But love does no accounting. And that is an accounting word that's used here. It's actually taking a person and is using an Excel spreadsheet. Well, maybe they didn't have Excel then. But it was something like that, okay? They took out their clay tablet and they marked on it, okay? And they kept track in an accounting, okay? Our accountants here would love this, okay? You actually did it, okay? Before you even had computers. And he said, no, no. In love, we don't keep account of wrongs or failures. <laughs> because love does not delight in evil. It takes no pleasure in another's misfortune. That's not really true, is it? There's a lot of church people that see another church to have something bad happen and they're like, yes. <laughs> it's true. Christians pray against other Christians at times. Get upset at other Christians when we forget the fact that we're all the body of Christ, all meant to be working together and that the enemy is not the Presbyterians down the street. Yep. It's the assemblies of God. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's Satan and the powers of darkness that want to seek and destroy and hinder Christ and don't love Jesus. Love does not delight in evil. Love rejoices with the truth. <laughs> um, something happened yesterday. Sorry about that. Something happened yesterday, and um, we were discussing something about Philip, and I had one view of something that had happened for Philip, uh, and Debbie had a different view. And for the first time in 41 years, I was the one who was right, and she wasn't. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not as gracious as she is because she actually said, you were right, Bill. <laughs> Love doesn't gloat in the truth. <laughs> Love doesn't see that. <laughs> yep, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Love rejoices with truth. And then as the text comes to a conclusion, it says love always protects. It doesn't talk about the shortcomings of another so that you can demean them. 1 Peter 4, 8 uses this exact same word that's here in 1 Corinthians. And it's the, in the verse that says that love covers a multitude of sins. Covers. Love always protects. It covers a multitude of sins. Love always trusts. Love believes the best from the other person. That's been a challenge sometimes. When you have a low self-esteem and your spouse speaks to you and they're talking like this to you and it's not because of them but it's because your view of yourself is down here and their view of you is up here so they're talking like this only when you feel like this they're doing what to you? No, you're doing this to you because of this view that you've made of yourself. Love trusts. I trust that Debbie thinks highly of me. That Debbie wants the best for me. That, that Debbie wants me to be happy. That she doesn't want to tick me off or make me impatient because besides it's frustrating for her. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. It believes that good is coming and good will happen. And love always perseveres. It endures. It keeps at it. It doesn't quit. It never stops. It transforms others. It's, it's a person who says, it doesn't matter what 
old age is bringing me right now. I'm going to stay at this. Did you see the couple? It's so, so appropriate. She was praying there that he would survive. And you know, some of us when we get old get a bit crotchety. <laughs> and some of our behaviors are not as nice as they once were. And sometimes it gets whole, hard to get old. But love, love perseveres even all the way through the old age. So Paul goes on, love never fails. <laughs> you know, when you're doing these things, you can't fail. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what's completeness? Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes again, when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. That's when love becomes fully complete. That's when Jesus returns, when God who is love comes again. That's when we're perfect. And then he finishes with this. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I acted like a child. No, that's not what it says. Sorry, I know girls, you're thinking that, and guys, we don't mind being boys, right? He says, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Incidentally, the Corinthians were known for their mirrors. But go get a piece of aluminum foil when you get home. And see how well you can see your reflection in the aluminum foil. Because the mirrors that they made were like aluminum foil. And they could get an idea. They got, they got this sort of image and all. But it wasn't like the mirrors that we have. So don't even compare. He says, now, now. We see only a reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see what? Face to face. When perfection comes, then we see Jesus face to face. Folks, we need to look for Jesus in one another. When you're in an argument with your spouse, look for Jesus in them because the argument's occurring to help you get closer to Jesus. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. I look at Debbie sometimes. I say, man, you know, I know a lot about her. You know, I understand a lot of things about her. Yeah, I can do a pretty good job even on the gifts I select for her. I know I'm overdoing it when I'm overdoing it. <laughs> I, I, I know this lady. But have you ever stopped to look at your spouse and thought, but there's so much more. There's so much more treasure inside of this person. There's so much more I don't know. And every day she's becoming something new. Every day there's more to her. But someday, someday in front of Jesus, we will fully know and be known by him. Wow. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, friends is love. Barclay said, faith without love is cold. Hope without love is grim. Love is the fire which kindles faith and it is the light which turns hope into certainty. So before we renew our vows, I need to ask you, not, don't jump up yet. <laughs> Where are you at with Jesus? You're not going to be able to love them fully if you don't fully renew your commitment to Jesus and His love. You're not going to be able to respect them completely if you don't begin again with the renewal of your commitment to Jesus. So where are you at with Jesus? He loves you unconditionally. He's modeled honor and respect and even in the toughest action, respecting the Father and saying, okay, I will go and I will die. Where are you at with Jesus? Father, 
We need to renew our commitments to you so that we can, for those of us who are married, can renew our commitment to our spouses. But it's a question for every single one of us here today, God. Where do we stand in our relationship with you? Have we accepted your unconditional love? Have we submitted to that love? Do we truly believe and are we really going to live for you, Jesus? We confess that there are times that we are far from these words about love. Forgive us, God, and give us a new relationship. In Jesus' name.